get all the wonderful election year coverage you deserve and crave with a, sub a subscription to Blaze TV. Go to blazetv.com slash stew. Enter the promo code stew. You get 20 bucks off. I mean, you're going to need to save money uh, this year, I promise you. If you're not a Blaze TV subscriber yet, we'd love to have you on YouTube. YouTube.com slash stew does America. Subscribe, like the video, and hit the bell for notifications. Dan Andros is here to cover all the media's failures on Israel over the past couple of weeks and actually one success. I know it's shocking development. There's been a huge update in the scandal surrounding Harvard President Claudine Gay. We have the latest on that. But we start by doing the state of the race 2024 part 10, I think we are on. I don't know. Every time we do an election update, we're just making the number higher. And it's important because the race is important. You know, there's a lot of talk about what you should be covering in an election year. A lot of people are like, well, we got the uh, everyone just wants to cover the horse race. And it's like, well, there's some validity to that, right? Like the horse race, like kind of at the end of the horse race, you, you know who wins the horse race. So it's kind of important to cover the horse race. So we will do some of that, of course, with all the developments that are going on and the things that you need to know. We have an announcement on that coming up in just a couple of seconds. So don't miss that. Let me tell you where everybody is, okay? Because you come back from, hopefully you had a wonderful holiday and, uh, you know, Christmas and New Year's. And I know uh, Hanukkah, of course, and, and so many of you uh, are big Kwanzaa. Uh, celebrators, as I am. Uh, we had the, the tree and the, the, and the balloon, I think, up uh, for the entire season. So we are now past that. We're back to, uh, to, I don't know, man, real life. It's no longer the holidays. And you come back in and you're just slapped in the face by the election. Like there's no, there's nothing, there's no time to waste here. We, yesterday was two weeks until Iowa. So you are now less than two weeks before the Iowa caucuses. Kind of a big deal, right? Like we're Right there, right in the middle of this, right away. So let's get you up to speed. Um, Trump is going to be doing a town hall with Fox News. Uh, this is ahead of the Iowa caucuses. It's not quite clear. It, you know, Trump hasn't really um, gone crazy trying to uh, invest resources. That you know, most of his resources is going to his legal troubles, honestly. So he hasn't been like spending a fortune in Iowa. How close is Iowa? We. Don't really know. We'll get into what we do know here in a little bit. Um, but he's going to be with Brett Baer and Martha McCallum in front of those caucuses. Then you have DeSantis, Haley, and Vivek Ramaswamy. They're all going to be making closing arguments in, in interviews uh, with the Des Moines Register. And uh, as well as CNN is part of that as well. Uh, they'll be trying to make their closing arguments there. And a lot of you are saying, well, why aren't you covering the big news? Where is Asa Hutchinson? Well, Ace is going to Iowa. Yes, I think by himself, but Florida, uh, former Governor Asa Hutchinson, uh, he's going to be going to Iowa and trying to win that caucus. Or, in his actual words, hopefully he can show it as a strong fourth. There's only like six candidates in the race, so trying to get to fourth is not... A huge success, I wouldn't say, but uh, Asa Hutchinson seems to think, well, eventually all the other candidates will fade away and it'll just be me. They're just, it's just waiting for Asa's time to shine. He's flying all over the country. I read a really sad story over a vacation where he's just riding, he's going all over the country on like commercial flights by himself. He's like, you know, he's like a door-to-door -door salesman uh, doing his best on that particular front. So we talked to you about what do we know about Iowa? What do we know about New Hampshire, which are coming up in the next few weeks? Like incredibly little, like a pathetic amount. I don't know what happened to the polling industry this election cycle. It seems like they've all gone home. No one has a job anymore in the polling industry. There's almost nobody polling these states. Now, we are getting occasional polls. We'll give you some of the details on that. But just to kind of give you a sense of where we are right now, we haven't had a poll in a couple of weeks of Iowa. Again, we're two weeks away. How are we going multiple weeks without any polling information? It's, it really is incredible. But this is uh, what we have, the most recent polls we have. There's a few that came out before Christmas. And it is hard to poll around the holidays, so maybe you give these guys a break. I would, I would expect you'd be getting polls this week and next week. We will see. But the last few polls had Trump at 50%. Um, DeSantis about 18 and Haley about 17. So kind of a close contact uh, contest there for second place, but Trump way ahead of the field in Iowa. New Hampshire's a little bit more of a convoluted story, honestly. The most recent poll that we have from Iowa, there's a couple of them, both show Nikki Haley about 30 percent 
which is much higher than we've seen anyone in any of these states uh, leading up to uh, New Hampshire, at least in a very long time. Uh, Trump at 44, Nikki Haley at 30, Chris Christie at 12 in one poll in New Hampshire. Another poll in New Hampshire had Trump at 33, Haley 29, and Christie at 13. Now, do I, is it really a four-point race? It's kind of hard to believe, but, you know, these candidates aren't running national races yet. Donald Trump is a national race in and of himself, right? Like he's a national candidate. He can kind of go out there and talk on TV and get all the attention. And he's winning by a lot nationally. When you get local, the races close a little bit, particularly in New Hampshire. And New Hampshire is a weird state, right? It's a smaller state. It's a very moderate state. However, a victory by Haley there leads directly into South Carolina, her home state. and maybe gives her some sign of life uh, for the campaign. Uh, so there's been some talk of Trump maybe thinking about her as VP uh, as a possibility. Um, the Trump supporters, I don't think, particularly like that all that much. Uh, I don't know if the Haley supporters really like her being associated with him. I mean, it's just a mess right now as it is. Um, however, I will say that the general election looks about as good as it's looked in a while. Now, I don't think this is a reason to get overly optimistic, but it's certainly better than the alternative. A fraying coalition, black, Hispanic, young voters abandoned Biden as the election year begins. Uh, Biden's failure to consolidate his victorious 2020 support has left him narrowly trailing Trump. In a new USA Today Suffolk University poll, Biden's failure to consolidate support in key parts of the coalition that elected him in 2020 has left him narrowly trailing Trump. It's likely the Republican nominee, uh, 30, the likely Republican no- nominee, 39 to 37, 17 percent support an unnamed third party candidate. This is one of the reasons I would suggest caution with looking at polls like this about who is actually winning the general election right now. Yes, we're far away and that's part of it. But another big part of it is that massive number, 17% in the third party. God knows what that means. Look, be honest about it. No third party candidate is going to get 17% in this election. It's incredibly unlikely. RFK Jr. will disagree, I'm sure. Uh, you know, I don't know, maybe Jill Stein will be like, no, I'm, this is the year for me. You know, my 12th attempt at this will be the time I get to 17%. Uh, for the Green Party. But the bottom line here is it's very unlikely. Most of those people are going to find a home. Well, where is that home going to be? Let me give you some of the underlying demographics and see if we can figure this out. Biden now claims the support of just 63 percent of black voters, a precipitous decline from the 87 percent he carried in 2020, according to the Roper Center. He trails among Hispanic voters by five percentage points, 39 to 34. In 2020, he had swamped Trump among that demographic group two to one. And that was a 65 to 32 last time. So massive drop offs. I mean, Joe Biden has no chance to win this election if he loses the Hispanic vote. I mean, there's no way he's going to win. I and mean, that would be a shocking, shocking outcome. Um, now, it's different as well for younger voters among voters under 35, a generation largely at odds with GOP on issues such as abortion access and climate change. Trump now leads 37 to 33 um, uh, with younger voters after they overwhelmingly backed Biden in 2020. And this is where I would Add a sense of caution here if, you, if you're optimistic about these polls. Look, it's early. This stuff might hold up. It might not. But the reason why you're seeing this among young voters in particular, a lead for Donald Trump, is not because necessarily people are flocking to Donald Trump. What they're doing here, and you notice by these numbers, 37, 33, I mean, I'm not a mathematician, but I'm pretty sure that adds up to 70, leaving 30% not voting for either. Now, is that possible? Sure, it's possible, but it's incredibly unlikely that that's the way that this election actually plays out. And when you look closer at why younger voters are abandoning Joe Biden, they're not abandoning Joe Biden to run to Donald Trump because they love his economic policies or they love his tax policies or they love, you know, that he wants to build a giant FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C. They're going toward Donald Trump uh, uh, really in very limited numbers. Where they're going is into the ether. They're going into, I'm not voting, I'm not sure, RFK Jr., third party, all these other possibilities. Because the, largely the reason they're leaving Joe Biden right now at this moment is they see him as too pro-Israel. They see him as a guy who's taking a stand on Israel's side, which they don't like. And they are going toward Israel and abandoning Biden, maybe to send a message, maybe because they found a candidate that they like 
uh, more. I mean, RFK Jr. has similar views on Israel, um, uh, arguably, as Joe Biden, uh, as, a, as a maybe a more skeptical Democrat, right? Like someone who doesn't want to get involved in foreign affairs, uh, you know, uh, someone who's more on the Bernie Sanders side of that particular uh, argument. So is it real? Like, do you think those people, when they settle, do they really settle with Jill Stein? Do they really settle with RFK Jr. or do they wind up coming home in a close election when Donald Trump's the evil Hitler uh, that the media keeps telling them about over and over again? Don't they go back to Joe Biden? That's the risk. And that is something to legitimately be worried about. And the thing about this here, which is fascinating, is Donald Trump always had the upper hand here. We told you this from the very beginning, right? Like, you know this. Donald Trump was the former president of the United States. He's an incumbent, basically. He's running, essentially, as an incumbent. And yes, he has had his issues, his challenges, his stupid stuff he's said. We all know about that. Um, But he always had the advantage here. The way you cut into this lead is to go to people who are not Donald Trump acolytes, right? To people who like Donald Trump, maybe think he deserves another chance, and tell them, hey, We love Donald Trump, too. But, hey, you can't have Donald Trump again because if you want Donald Trump, he's going to win the nomination and then lose the general election. And when you have polling, like I just gave you, over and over again showing similar things, it becomes very difficult to run an insurgent campaign. Why? Because you can run a Chris Christie campaign in that environment, right? You could say, actually, Donald Trump's bad. If you like him, you're worse. And uh, I'm going to win because I'm going to speak the truth to the American people and I'm going to be a totally different candidate and tell you how bad Donald Trump is. You can run that candidate. There's just not enough audience for it. Right. But there is a, a, a theoretical reason you're in the race. If you're in the race saying essentially like Vivek Ramaswamy, hey, Donald Trump's the greatest president of my lifetime and I'm running against him because I'm younger, I guess I, I'm more well spoken. Uh, I don't know. What's the reason? You know, if you're Ron DeSantis, who I think has a really good argument for his record and and I think would be a great president, uh, the argument that he's been able to make, he doesn't want to piss off all the Donald Trump people. He wants to keep as many of them around as he can. So he kind of tries to make the argument, hey, I will perform better. I will be more focused on what you care about. And the bottom line is I will beat Joe Biden where Trump will lose to him. He's already lost to him once. He's going to lose to him again. And that argument made a lot of sense when poll after poll after poll was not showing Donald Trump beating Joe Biden. It's just hard to make this argument in this environment. Haley has the same issue. Haley's polls are probably the only ones who are really better than Trump's in a general election uh, so far. And even that, though, it's, it's like a tough thing to convince people of. Hey, I will win by even more? Question. I, like, I, it's just a tough argument to make for an insurgency. Uh, when you have a president who's basically acting as an incumbent and voters are treating like an incumbent. This is not an easy road. And so far, I think both Haley and DeSantis and, of course, Christie and even Asa Hutchinson are finding that out, um, along with Vivek. Um, Trump is, and of course, when you take that argument off the, the, the plate, and you take that off the table, and you say, okay, well, you got to beat Donald Trump, but you can't really convincingly argue your the general election victory, he's going to lose the general election. When you take that off the table, what do you have? Well, you have this. Trump blows away GOP field with 50-point lead. Haley ties with DeSantis for second place. According to Real Clear polling average, uh, it is 62.5% for Trump. Uh, DeSantis and Haley at 11.2%. Now, look, I've said this 100 million times. I will continue to say it every single day. Uh, probably until you get so sick of me, you never want to listen again. But like, I don't really care about national polls right now. Um, I don't, especially in the primary, they really don't make much sense. It's interesting, maybe at times, to get an occasional check-in on the national number, but really it doesn't make that much difference. What you want to look at are these state polls, and what we're doing is getting large swaths of national polls from these big pollsters and nothing at these state levels. Screw your, don't give me national stuff. We're two weeks away from Iowa. Give me Iowa polls. That's what I want, Iowa. I want Iowa information. I want to know what's going on in Iowa. I want to know what's going on in New Hampshire. When's the last time we had a poll in South Carolina? It's the third one. We're getting absolutely nothing out of these states, and this is a big, big problem. Um, So what's going on as far as the general picture goes? Well, I mean, 
if you listen to the media, everything's going great for Joe Biden. Uh, Biden's strong stock market still trails Trump. And they give you a little handy dandy uh, graph here where it does show that Trump's uh, you know, uh, stock market average was uh, much higher, about 17 points higher than Joe Biden's. Of course, you know, when Trump had those numbers, we were told that the stock market is not the economy. You can't, look at the, you can't look at the stock market and tell what the economy is. The economy is much broader than that. And it's bad for people. Trust us. Even though they keep telling you that it's good, it's actually bad. And now they're saying, even though everyone's telling you it's bad, it's actually good. Which, sit back and wonder at this for a second. What would it be like? I know you're probably a conservative. You've got some conservative leanings. Maybe you're center-right. Maybe you're a libertarian. Maybe you're hardcore conservative. Whatever you are, think of how nice it would be to be a liberal for a second. Like, think uh, all the effort that's put in on a daily basis to justify whatever you think. All of the effort that's put in by media source after media source after media source to spin things not against you, but for you all the time. All of your views are promoted as these wonderful things, and all of your uh, political enemies' views are, are promoted as these terrible, terrible outliers and crazy, you know, uh, uh, phobic, uh, get, name the phobia, uh, phobic, terrible uh, viewpoints. I mean, it would be fun. It would be fun to try just for a couple weekends, right? Like, you know, it's like in a college when you used to experiment. It's that type of stuff. Wouldn't it be fun that everything in the media was just lined up to enforce the things you already believed? Wouldn't that just be joyous? You wouldn't become a better person. You wouldn't become smarter. You wouldn't learn anything. You wouldn't figure out the world any better. But it would be nice just to not have that constant, you know, centrifugal force being pushed against you all the time. Um, now, the next group here that we're going to get into is, and this is the next season here, the reason, another reason why Trump is, a, is so far ahead, it's not just because he's being treated as an incumbent, it's because he's being targeted as, I don't know, a terrorist by the government. And people who have some affinity for Donald Trump are saying this is wrong, he shouldn't be treated this way. And because he's being targeted by the legal establishment and everything else, People are tending to defend him, and yet thus his poll numbers go through the roof. Trump's courtroom and campaign trail collision is about to become a reality, says CNN. You go through, this, you go through all the coverage on this, honestly. And it's the same. Like They are going to focus on the, these trials more than the actual race. They are going to do that. And that the result of that, of course, is going to be that people are going to rally to support Donald Trump. And then once he gets through this primary, their goal, I don't know if this is going to work, but their plan is to then turn the tides against Donald Trump and make every independent voter think that he's the worst person who's ever lived. Will that work? It's a risk, right? It's a risk for them. It could very well spectacularly fail and backfire. But this is what they're planning to do. They don't want it to be Ron DeSantis. They don't want it to be Nikki Haley. They don't want it to be Vivek. They don't want it to be anybody except Donald Trump because they think they have that game plan down. They've had to deal with this twice already. They know how to convince independent voters to turn on Donald Trump. They did it in 2020. They're going to do it again. This is their outline for this election. Uh, are they right? Uh, they might be. They might be, despite all the stuff that's going on with Joe Biden. It's certainly possible. I mean, all those that poll that I, I went through, all those numbers where, you know, Hispanic voters are on, on Donald Trump's side and black voters are down, you know, 25, 30 percent younger voters. It's still a, a very close election. In fact, Real Clear Politics average still has it as only a two point lead for Donald Trump. And these are miraculous polls for Trump demographically. Can Donald Trump win in an environment when they actually decide to talk about all of his negatives constantly? Um, now, of course, there's the Senate going on as well in 2024. Uh, the Republicans have a great chance to take the Senate. Where have we heard this before? I mean, Wall Street Journal even says this. Republicans have a great chance to retake the Senate in 2024, but they did in 2022 as well. Um, here's their map of where it stands right now. They have uh, Republicans with 50 seats likely to win, Democrats only 43. So... If you remember last year in 2022, we made a massively big deal about the 2022 election, not because of 2022, but because of what it could mean in 2024. If Democrats had done uh, more poorly and Republicans had gathered more seats in the uh, Senate, there was a chance at a filibuster proof majority in the Senate in 2024 and maybe a Republican president, something that would really change our society, in my view, for the better. 
that didn't really happen in 2022, unfortunately. And Republicans underperformed. And now we have a situation in 2024 where they can still make major gains, but really it's going to be almost impossible to get to those uh, levels. Well, I tell you all this because we're going to be doing a lot of these updates, of course, on this show. But I want to make you aware of something else we're going to be doing. This is going to be available for now, at least, only on the podcast feed, the audio podcast feed. It's the state of the 2024 race with myself, Stu Gear, giving you uh, a short uh, you know, I don't know, maybe we're kind of still feeling it out, but 10 to 20 minute outline of the big stories you really need to know about the election as we get closer to these primaries. Um, and it's going to be available in the morning. So it's going to be kind of totally separate. For, it'll be on the same feed. If you're already a subscriber to this podcast channel, just start appearing, appearing in your feed uh, free and nothing you have to do. Uh, but it's just a little bit of a chance to give you more updated information, maybe a little bit more of a deep dive into one particular story or poll. Um, uh, kind of trying to give you a sensible piece of, of, of the election because, as you know, if you go to the mainstream media, you're going to get something totally different. So we're going to try to give you the other perspective and give you something in the mornings to chew on for the day, and then we'll be back to review the news of the day here on the Studios America podcast. So nothing changes here, but mornings we're going to give you an ad additional burst of election news. So make sure to go subscribe. Go to your podcast feed wherever you uh, subscribe to podcasts. Make sure you subscribe to this feed, and it'll stop po start popping up here in the next few days uh, when we uh, get everything technically uh, worked out. We want to make sure you have the best information with actual truth behind it. It, not crazy nonsense from the media. You want real truth, real perspective. Where is the state of the race on a day to day basis? It's on the podcast feed wherever you get your podcast for Stu Does America. Dan Andros is going to join us next. Stu Does America. I'm joined now by Dan Andros. He's a managing editor at CBN News and host of CBN's Quick Start podcast, which you can subscribe to wherever you get your pods, podcasts, of course. Uh, Dan, thanks so much for coming on the program. Having me. Uh, appreciate it. Um, so it's interesting. I was um, going through the last couple of weeks and doing everything I could to avoid the news. And I knew one of the most important stories, of course, in the world is what's going on in Israel. And I wanted to have you back on to kind of review uh, what we missed over the past couple of weeks. And, and one headline I did catch was from the New York Times. And uh, the New York Times gives you this headline, Screams Without Words, How Hamas Weaponized Sexual Violence on October 7th. And I will be honest with you, when I saw the headline, I intentionally did not read the story because I don't want to know the details of that story. Um, however, it's incredibly important, and I will say it was your beginning of the year pitch uh, for a review segment, this horrific story about what Hamas actually did on October 7th. Yeah, it was either this or a cooking segment to start <laughs> right. the year, but uh, we went, I guess we went in this direction. But uh, no, I, I mean, honestly, it was it's one of those times where you're like, okay, this is more what the New York Times should be doing. Mm. They're a massive outlet with a lot of resources and they put a lot of effort and resource into this one, so credit where credit is due. And honestly, I couldn't even get through, it's a very long article, I couldn't get through the whole thing because it's so graphic and so gruesome. And uh, it just struck me as I was going through this article, Stu, and it basically details all of the, you know, they went through great lengths to confirm all of these sexual assaults and rapes, essentially, and murders in most of the cases that happened on October 7th. And remember, in the days after that, you had this slow response by so many people, even places like the UN for Women, uh, UN Women, I guess this is a specific designation they have at the UN. And they were like, well, we're disturbed by this. Like, we should look into it, right? And, and these are the same organizations that during the Me Too movement would fall all over their feet. And just fall down all over everybody to try to talk, believe all women. And then this comes out from Israel and we're like, I don't know. Uh, if you remember, Stu, the uh, images of there's one that sticks out of my mind. It's the woman who was in the back of that pickup truck and her lifeless body is face down. And these terrorists are gleefully shouting and basically sitting on top of her body. 
And the media and people on social media started pushing this narrative and these rumors that, no, 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 she was actually alive. And this is Shani Luke. And they're like, no, no, she's alive. That Hamas was just taking her to a hospital. And uh, they, it was, she was probably shot by Israeli soldiers. If you go back and look at the history. That's That's what people were trying to say at this time. And she was so clearly dead and so clearly abused. And it's it shocks the mind, Stu, that people are still some of these tweets are still up there. If you look at that, where they basically said that what I just said about Shandy Luke. But uh, the point is now you're reading this from The New York Times and the shame that these people should be feeling for basically sticking to a narrative, an anti-Israel narr narrative, an anti-Semitic narrative in the face of these facts. They were doing things, Stu, that I honestly are so graphic and gruesome that I, I don't even think I can actually say, I haven't tried to say them out loud yet. And I don't think I want to or can, mm. if I wanted to say them out loud, you just go read the New York Times report and see how far you can get through it. But it's stuff, picture the worst horror movie you could you could imagine. And it's beyond that. Yeah, uh, you're right. It's I mean, really I, shocking. I mean, you think of, uh, you know, a Saw or Hostel or uh, Terrifier is one of the recent ones where they're doing the most gruesome things they can to women tied to sex sexual violence. Uh, that's what's in the article. And, and you know, I'm glad you pointed out uh, credit where credit is due to The New York Times in that, like, you're right. This is the type of thing they do really well. I mean, The Times can do th they are capable of doing things like this where they can actually um, expend a lot of resources to get to the bottom of these things because, I mean, the article, I, I don't, I'm, as with you, I'm not going to go through what is in the article. I, I mean, I, I think a, a lot of people in the audience know how horrible this was. You might not need to read every detail of it, um, but it is uh, it's some of the worst stuff you, you'll ever hear. And they went to the trouble of actually viewing the videotape, viewing the visual evidence that supported this, talking to the people who uh, witnessed it with their own eyes. So they did go down this road, and it was really important because a lot of the people who read the New York Times, and partially I think because of the type of tact the New York Times has taken toward this story, which has been generally uh, favorable to Hamas, uh, certainly to the Palestinian cause, if you will, um, because a lot of the people who read the New York Times saw that sort of coverage, they probably were the ones doubting that this stuff actually happened. And I'm glad the New York Times at least did something here to clear this up, but uh, you know, when we're talking about this war generally, people are saying, well, maybe Israel needs to stop. They need to, uh, to back down, they're going too far. Well, read this story and then tell me they're going too far because it certainly doesn't yeah. seem like they're going too far at all. No, and I mean, you have the Biden administration like constantly getting pressured now to tell them just, whoa, 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 slow it down, ease off. And look, Stu, the mantra coming out of the Me Too movement, what was it? Believe all women. Mm. Believe all women. Okay. Well, how about believe um, the the young woman? I don't have her name in front of me, but you've seen her face before. She's one of the more prominent hostages who was freed. She just spoke out in an interview recently, and one of the things she said was, as I'm reading through all of her quotes, was that um, she believed she was not raped. She says she was not raped, and she says the only reason she was not raped was she believes because her captors wife and children were there in the room that they that they were keeping her in basically all the time. But she was just talking about how evil these people are. And she said even her eyes, even even she's like, you know, sometimes, you know, she, it was such a traumatic experience. You know, you just wanted a hug. And like I saw another woman and I'm just like, you know, a woman to woman. I just want to hug. And she's like, but her eyes, she was so evil and so mean. And she actually made the comment that there are no good people in Palestine, like in the, no Palestinian is good. She said they're all bad. That that mm. was her assessment of the situation. This is from one of the uh, women who was abducted and held there. So if we're going to believe all women, I mean, you might want to at least take into account what that one is saying. Mm. Uh, it's amazing. Of course, you know, the, 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 the mantra is so stupid because the other woman who is really bad in this situation was also a woman. So do we believe her? As well, I mean, right. it's you don't believe people because of their right. gender, and obviously, right. like, you give a little bit of grace to a person who was, uh, you know, 
captured in this way. I'm sure, obviously, there are some Palestinians who don't agree with this stuff. I mean, we see right. it in polls. It's like 5%. Uh, so thank God those 5% do exist um, that at least show up in the polls saying we shouldn't murder innocent Jews. Right. That's a wonderful, wonderful 5%. <laughs> but, you know, this is the problem when you're talking about the war going forward. How do you deal with a population where 90 and 95 percent come together in these polls and say, well, we should be able to do this. What do you do when when you have 50, 60, 70 percent that agree with October 7th, which agree with the actions of Osama bin Laden? You there's no I don't know what you do. You can't. We've now found out that leaving them alone and building a wall in between and crossing your fingers isn't the right move. But we're being told by international sources that they should just stop uh, all the bombing, stop the attacks. I mean, no one else wants to take these guys in. So no. what do you do here if you're Israel? Right. If you're Israel, your option is to wipe them out, just just completely annihilate Hamas to the best of their, to the best of your abilities. I mean, if you're Israel, Stu, like, how are you assessing the situation? Are you sitting there and I mean, you're weighing your options and everyone's like, hey, hold on, ease back now. Are you taking that seriously? Is anyone in Israel taking that advice seriously going, well, you know what, you're not, you know, you're right. We should just sit back and think about it. I think the only reason they've even listened to anything anyone is saying is because those hostages are there and they want to get them out. Um, if it weren't for those hostages being in there, this place would be a parking lot right now. Um, I think, I, I mean, I think that's the only leverage they have. And I mean, who know? I mean, I'm hoping some of them are still alive, but it's just, it's getting more and more dire day by day. But I mean, what do you do, Stu, if you're in that situation, you're Israel and you're looking at your options. Is is there another option? I don't see one. I don't, I don't see one either. And, and I mean, I think you're, you're right. It's uh, One problem with this is, of course, it strangely incentivizes people to take hostages, right. which is which yeah. is a problem. But I mean, they ha there are areas of Gaza that do look like a parking lot already. And I, yes. I just don't know what your other option is. I don't see how you can allow people to live in an area that's this close to you when this is what they do with uh, what independence they have been given in the first place. Remember, Israel was occupying this region. They moved out of the region with this hope that if we, you know, maybe, you know, cooler heads will prevail and, and once they get a taste of, of, of their own uh, ability to make their own decisions, things will turn out better. Well, that didn't happen. And they their decisions were to elect Hamas into leadership. And uh, and then, you know, largely support. I mean, polling is showing the, the people in the Palestinian territories largely support what happened October on October 7th. So I, I just don't think there is another option. I mean, I, I, my fear, honestly, for Israel is that they're not going to go far enough. They're going to be pressured by us in, in America, by the media internationally and in other countries, and they'll stop before they actually get this job done. And then we're going to be on the air uh, in X amount of years, Dan, talking about the next horrible attack that Hamas or some other terrorist group has committed. And, you know, like uh, you see the wavering on our side, especially in the Biden administration. You know, Biden came out and said some good things early on, said he was very supportive of Israel and, 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 and what they were doing. But what that has done has cost him younger voters on the Democratic side who have abandoned him on that issue. And you can mm. see him turning back, realizing he can't lose that support when it comes to the polls. He's down in almost every poll to Donald Trump now, largely because of this reason. He's using losing younger voters who are going third party and or not voting at all. And uh, those people are saying they're leaving because they don't like what Biden did with Israel. Well, Biden has no spine on this stuff, and there's no way he's going to stick by this viewpoint if he's going to lose an election over it. And this really puts Israel in a terrible position. Yeah, yeah, it really does. And I and I was the idiot. Like, I always try to give people the benefit of the doubt. And in the first couple of days after this attack, I thought, you know what? I expected sort of the radical left to to come out with the anti-Israel stuff. I mean, I thought maybe they'd, they'd wait till at least, you know, the bodies were cold. But um Turns out they started doing that pretty fast. And Biden said a couple good things early. And I thought, OK, you know, maybe uh, Joe is going to going to have a backbone on this. But you're absolutely right. He has been more and more spineless with each passing day. And the fact that anyone would listen to these uh, just mindless activists that just go along and parrot whatever they're being told to say by, I don't know, their college professors or whoever the, it might be, 
And it just makes me worry, honestly, Stu, about, I mean, we've talked about sort of this post-truth society we're living in where it's like, hi, I'm a 20-year-old woman. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Do I look like a woman? You know, And then you're supposed to go, hey, it's nice to meet you, ma'am. Right. And we're supposed to live in this post-truth world where we're believing things that are saying things that are blatantly not true. And it kind of makes me nervous because I look at it on an issue like this. When we have video of all these things happening, they're proudly trumpeting it all over the place going, look at all the murdering we're doing. And everyone's like, nah, it's Israel's fault there. That's Israel's doing that. Probably an Israel psyop. And you're like, I don't even know what you do with this at a you know, on a broader scale on this post post truth society, Stu, on so many issues, it's starting to bleed into everything. And video evidence doesn't even matter. What do you do with that? I know. And this is before we really get into the legitimate, you know, era of deep fakes and AI. Yeah. Like <laughs> all this stuff is going to become easier to generate. You're going to actually see video. People aren't going to believe the real stuff. I mean, this is just going to get harder and harder and harder for people to deal with. And, you know, again, we've talked about this many, many times, Dan. Uh, but like this is what happens to a society that has no foundation, right? Like when you aren't yes. tethered to something <laughs> greater and you wind up looking at this stuff and trying to, you know, judge based on, you know, whatever commentator you like or whatever, you know, Twitter personality is, 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 uh, is in your feed. You know, it's hard to judge this stuff if you don't have yeah. larger foundations. We've got about 30 seconds left. Yeah, no, 100 percent. And that's, you know, being a Christian myself, that's that's what I lean on. And that, you know, uh, speaks to exactly uh, what you're saying, because, it, I mean, otherwise it's hopeless looking at the things that are going on in the world. You're just like it's going to lead people to do crazy things if they don't have, in my opinion, um, a confidence and a faith that we have a sovereign God who is working all things ultimately for good, even if it's going to be dark and crappy in in the midterm right like we we get to see something good at the end um but it might be might be a little rough in the meantime <laughs> happy tw i'm sorry to kick off 2024 <laughs> like this everybody i mean this is just uh a little a little uh, a little bit of a debbie downer this may be your only off. interview in 2024 after bringing I, this to the table <laughs> uh, but no seriously incredibly important and you know i didn't i'm glad the times reporting didn't go completely yeah. uh under the radar even though it was during the holidays. It's important for people to understand, and especially if you if you are, I don't know, if you're on the borderline on this. I don't know how you're on the borderline, frankly. But if you're on one, if you're one of these people that were like, "Gosh, I've seen stuff on both sides. I'm not sure." Read that reporting. I mean, again, the New York Times isn't the most trustworthy source, but they have spent most of their resources trying to create sympathy for the Palestinian cause. The fact that they actually printed this says quite a bit. Uh, Dan Andros, managing editor at CBN News. Are you guys still doing a lot of Israel updates and kind of keeping people up to date every day on the uh, YouTube channel? Yes, absolutely. A slight break there over uh, the holiday, but um, Chuck Holton is doing daily reports for us. I know you guys have had him on and also our team in Jerusalem with Chris Mitchell. They are um, back on it and doing daily reports. You can check that out on our YouTube channel and on CBNnews.com. All right, CBN News, Dan Andros, the Quick Start podcast as well. Make sure to subscribe to that. Dan, thanks so much for coming on. All right, thanks, Stu. So the Harvard story is fascinating. Let me give you a quick review. First, there were some rumblings of plagiarism around her. She's the president of Harvard. And Harvard was like, look, we stand totally behind Claudine Gay. She's our president. We love her. Then she made an appearance in front of Congress where she couldn't quite bring herself to say that saying the destruction and wiping out genocide of the uh, of the Jewish people, that wasn't really a violation of community standards at Harvard. And people were like, that really? Like all the stuff, all the you know, safe spaces you provide from microaggressions and you can't say that it, calling for genocide is against policy at Harvard? Well, that happened and then Harvard made a big statement. They said, you know what? Look, we've we've thought about this. Uh, we know the whole genocide thing, but you know we're standing behind Claudine Gay. We absolutely love her. Then more plagiarism accusations came out, and they and Harvard said, you know what? We're not saying it quite as strongly, but we're still standing behind Claudine Gay. And then sadly for Claudine, another set of plagiarism 
uh, accusations came out. And this time they're like, all right, screw it. We can't do this anymore. Harvard President Claudine Gay is resigning the shortest tenure in university history. This is, of course, our oldest university here in the United States. And she is toast. Obviously, she I mean, like. I think we're at, what, two dozen now different accusations of plagiarism. They all are pretty convincing. I've looked at all of them. Uh, they go from paragraphs to I mean, large dissertations to footnotes. I mean, all sorts of stuff uh, plagiarized from other people. Uh, the New York Times is covering it. Here's what to know about Claudine Gay's resignation. Now, this is something what's fascinating about this is that the mainstream media told you this was not going to happen. And they basically kind of took the side of Claudine Gay, despite real problems that like, I mean, plagiarism is something that is, forget all the politics of this, really serious to, to academics and to, you think, journalists who, I mean, the New York Times is in the middle of suing open AI because they plagiarize their stuff, basically, but they were fine with Claudine Gay. It's seemingly at the beginning, that's now faded away and she is toast. Now, MIT is joining Harvard and Penn on a list of schools facing federal civil rights investigations. This is after uh, their uh, disastrous uh, uh, per, uh, performance in front of Congress as well. This has all gone really bad for uh, for Claudine Gay. But again, Claudine Gay is another person who'd had no real economic or academic uh, qualifications to get this gig in the first place, um, and you know she just wasn't you know qualified for this. She took shortcuts. She got this job for reasons other than her merit. And this is the same thing that happened at other universities, too. She's not alone in that one. It's just sad to see this happen over and over again. Claudine Gay now, though, out at Harvard. Well, Mickey Mouse has been around for a little while now. Uh, in fact, of course, started as Steamboat Willie way back in the day. Now, uh, this is important mainly because it's now been so much time that the, the copyright has expired. The, there's no longer, you're now in public domain with these characters. And, and this is starting to happen relatively frequently with really well-known characters. And for some reason, the first thing everyone's doing with the ability to put Mickey Mouse in a movie is to put him in a slasher film. I, this is happening over and over again. Mickey Mouse, it's Mickey's Mousetrap. It's the name of the movie. The trailer's already out. This just happened a couple of days ago. At the top, it says, this is not the fun house. No, no, it is not the fun house. And this got on the heels of Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. Now, again, why the jump to a slasher film right away? Winnie the Pooh had their situation where the, the copyright expired and, and uh, the trademark expired, and they were able to put Winnie the Pooh in a movie. And the first thing they do is get a Winnie the Pooh mask and have them go kill people. Mickey Mouse, same thing. I mean, you'd think there'd be... I, in fact, I don't even want to know what the alternatives are to the slasher movie because my guess is it gets really, really dark and weird, uh, even more weird than a slasher movie. But we do hope for better things from Mickey's Mousetrap than from Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, because the ratings on that one, not so good. Rotten Tomatoes has it at 3%. So I, even only 50% from the audience, which is pretty terrible, but 3% from critics. So... Uh, I don't have super high hopes for the new slew of Mickey Mouse slasher films. Okay, so here's what happened. There is a new lawsuit out, and you know, you think about this, unless you're getting murdered by Winnie the Pooh or Mickey Mouse, uh, Halloween's a great time for kids. They get uh, all the candy and it's, it's a wonderful, happy time. It should lead to happy things. In this case, it did not. Um, one of the things that you love more than anything else around Christmas, I mean, the kind of the cream of the crop is the Reese's product, right? The Reese's product, you get it, it's the best. You love that peanut butter. I don't know, it's not like normal peanut butter. It's just freaking delicious. Well, Hershey's now being sued because of deception and their Reese's peanut butter pumpkins. Now, if you ever had a Reese's peanut butter pumpkin, you know, it's one of the best delivery systems of the Reese's peanut butter because it's so much peanut butter. I mean, there's, they've almost abandoned the chocolate in them. There's a little coating on the outside. Well, she showed the pictures of it, and you see the cut packaging has this little cute little jack-o'-lantern face. The reality is just a blob of chocolate, but who cares? It's from Reese's. That makes it delicious. She wants $5 million in damages, by the way. $5 million.